Welcome back everyone to the Jake Bro Show. Joining us again today on the channel is Brandon Mitchell. He is a Canadian volunteer currently serving as a combat medic in Ukraine. He served four and a half years in the Canadian Army, spent some time in the UK. Currently, I believe you are in Sweden. Brandon, for people who are not familiar with you, can you please introduce yourself to the channel? Thanks for having me again, Jake. I'm Brandon. I grew up in Canada and I've lived all over the world. Um, the third week of the war, I went and I, I've served over 22 months in Hospitaller's Medical Battalion, uh, which works in support of the armed forces of Ukraine. Most of my time, 19 months in Ukraine, uh, was in the Donbass region. Um, elsewhere, of course, um, on my last five months up until Christmas, I, I served with the Marines in Kherson. So we had you on the channel about 10 months ago. I'll link that podcast down below if people want to get more of your backstory. But can you fill us in where you are now and why you're there? Yeah. So full disclosure, I never, I, I don't hide too much. Uh, I have my own YouTube and my own support community. Uh, I've come back to Sweden uh, and I've, I've been here since Christmas. Uh, I'm currently engaged in a case to uh, obtain my permanent residence, which is, uh, for all intents and purposes, it's um, it's it's the path to citizenship, and it would give me all the privileges of citizenship here, where where I lived before the war. I currently I'm employed uh, by a NGO, an organization that supports the Ukrainian armed forces, uh, particularly with medical needs and other logistical needs. Um, my my employer acquires a lot of medical equipment and also a lot of procurements for textiles that would actually go to they have contracts with other armies uh, around the world so able to clothe soldiers and get them out with a lot of things like like the ifax that you probably hear a lot about nowadays So this NGO, is that the work you were doing recently? You, you mentioned to me some kind of tour in the UK and you were able to meet some important people. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so the NGO, uh, Quartermaster for Ukraine, uh, NGO is a very broad term. Uh, they, they were quite sympathetic to to my situation here in Sweden. And... Um, I've been working in a logistical role, advising on the purchasing, acquiring and and assembling a lot of a lot of the things and arranging the shipments to Ukraine. Uh, we have we have people there. Uh, one woman, very effective in Donbass, who's been there just as long as me. Uh, but at the same time, I have a lot of freedom. Uh, I've had a lot of support from them. I'm I'm free to study. Uh, I, I finally attained my first civil qualification, civilian medical qualification. Uh, I'm working on another one, so I'm free to travel uh, to do those. And I was invited on a tour, uh, a, an organization called Solidarity, uh, Ukraine Solidarity Project, in conjunction with the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry and the Foreign Office, the British uh, Foreign Office. They arranged a tour uh, for medics who could talk about war crimes uh, that have been committed against medics, uh, against civilians, and and overall just to give contact uh, for politicians, uh, the public, even meeting Ukrainian school children who are now doing English and Ukrainian curriculum across the country. Uh, that 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 was amazing. I, I, you know, their dad. A lot of them, their dads are serving in in the army in Ukraine. So th that was one of the highlights. A uh, two week tour, of six cities in the UK it was really intense. Wow. Yeah. If anyone wants to see pictures and videos, they can check them out probably on Brandon's Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to upload some YouTube videos as well of the tour, and if if you'll humor me here, the school has also allowed us to. Uh, to take pictures and to share um, 
some of the work we've done there and 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 what those kids are doing uh, enough about that now but I, it it was pretty it, it, pretty damn inspiring uh, quite emotional if you have any feel good clips uh meeting with the children uh let me know and maybe i can end one of my videos with them thank you thank you uh so when do you plan or hope to be back in ukraine realistically we're looking at uh 5 to 6 months um there's i i have to go through this process and uh there's a there's a very good chance i will have my permanent residence uh in the meantime i will obtain at least one more qualification with the british nhs i'm i'm now legally i'm now legally in, entitled to to seek employment in the british ambulance service say for example uh um already but uh i'm i'm, I'm studying civil medicine uh i'm now doing a physiology course um I've had a lot of encouragement uh, from my my previous direct commander, for example, um, and there's also there's also a lot of work that we have to do here um, on the back end, which I've I've been privileged to get involved with. Uh, there's a lot of problems with particularly medical logistics, uh, which is something I do know about because there's many stages of care. And what what I found here in Sweden, I, I think this would be ubiquitous across Europe. Um, quite often, they they the, the hospitals that want to help us that are continuing, uh, they don't know where to send the supplies, and it creates a bottleneck uh, for casualty care, like a, a tactical casualty care, stabilization, hospital, and post. Like I've I processed oh, maybe a hundred thousand euros worth of supplies and really good things um just recently from one hospital but once you get into clinical care it's so damn complicated um so i'll, I'll be going around like i i i know now after 2 years coming from no medical background i know i don't know when it comes to clinical i don't know what th certain things are but i know what department of a hospital they belong in say for example um or what stage of care so th that's a big thing to do those presentations and then to put them in touch with groups in Ukraine, and I know a few. No, you really need to go to those guys. Like this should go there, and like even to cut us out of the loop, um, to not be the middleman in some cases. That's that's pretty ambitious, uh, considering that Sweden alone sends millions and millions of dollars a year worth of medical care that is given, not even state policy. You know, this is at local government level, so that's that's something that's something to be part of. We recently went past the two-year anniversary of this war. We spoke almost a year ago. I want to ask you, from your perspective, how do you think the war has changed this last year? Mm. Well, I'm going to be honest. Um, the war is certainly not lost. I know we can win the war. I I know many things that you talk about in your channel. I watch your channel, depend on what you talk about. Um, but right now, the reality is we're losing. Uh, how someone determines losing, um, I would I would say at the very least, we're not winning right now. Um, it's very, very different. Um, I'm not ashamed to say this because I heard this from... Irina, who was on, on the UK tour with me, and, and she said these words. I, I would never say them. Uh, I just thought them. Uh, the first year of the war was, in a sense, almost fun. Uh, and, and it wasn't fun, but um, we had a lot of artillery. Uh, the Russians had so much artillery. Uh, drones were not really a factor. Uh, the FPV drone did not exist, or in, in the sense it does now. Um, I remember in Donbass, uh, I can't tell you how many artillery shells would go in the, in the Lomonsky region where I worked, uh, in Solodar, Bakhmut direction, Klishkivka, um, and you never knew where they're going to hit, but 200 meters, 300 meters away all day. And the reality is now, uh, we don't have any artillery, <laughs> uh, virtual standstill. 
Um, the Russians still do a lot of artillery, but at, at, they fire at less than half uh, the intervals, maybe a third um, amount of the shells they're pumping out. Um, but they do have drones. And it, it seems like whenever we get things better, and, and this is my experience, it's a big war, but I, I talk to I talk to friends on, on different AOs and they have similar experience. It's like whenever we get an edge, it doesn't last like for a month or two. Um, thermal cameras on FPV drones. That was a game changer that really we started seeing in December. But uh, yes, there is less artillery now. Um, it, it's still a very real threat. Um, but the attacks are more precise now through drones. Uh, it's uh, maybe fun was a bad word, but it was it was a game of chance. It re, re, it really was in in many senses, and now a lot of the chance factor, um, and it's it's been taken out of the equation. I think for humans, we're really bad at gauging time, experiencing time. We want to see progress in the short term because our mood is affected by it. So that first year, when the Russians tried to take Kiev and, and they lost, they had to retreat from the Chernihiv region and um, the Chernobyl region. That was satisfying to see. That was within two months, pretty immediate. We then had the Kharkiv counteroffensive, absolutely incredible. The Russians had to pull off Snake Island, another retreat. They had to give up the city of Kherson. Even, even through last summer, uh, with the spectacle of Prigozhin's rebellion and seeing the Russians shooting down their own planes and firing on their own guys. Um, it's exhilarating because uh, we, if you support Ukraine, you want to see as much dysfunction and misfortune for Russia as possible, which is why Russian yeah. propaganda is so important to not talk about anything bad that happens for Russia. Just pretend like it didn't happen. Storm Shadow cruise missiles blowing up the Black Sea Fleet headquarters. That was like a headline for two days. That should have been a headline for like over a month. Russia's tragedies and losses, these A-50s worth $350 million, two being shot down in two months, like nothing sticks. Like there's so much tragedy and loss for the Russians. We just keep going, but for people who support Russia, they can keep showing the map. We advanced two cornfields or whatever outside of Avdivka, so it doesn't matter that February was Russia. This is according to UK intelligence. February was the deadliest month of the war for the Russian forces. You can argue it's an effective strategy for Putin just to send his people to die in mass quantities and not care about them to demoralize the West, demoralize democracies, demoralize the Ukrainians. So my next question for you, Brandon, is uh, what are Ukrainians doing to maintain their morale about how this war is going? Well, I won't lie. There is a divide uh, that started in society um, that I've become aware of. Um, there's many people that, okay, how do I say it? The guys with big arms who skip leg day, okay? They're not in the army. Um, we have a fantastic army, and, and I'm, I'm so proud. Um, I'm even more proud than of my own country, okay? Because it's, it's something I, I, I was the benefactor of, of a great country, Canada. You know, I, I benefited from that. I didn't put in the work, but I'm so proud of um, the armed forces of Ukraine, my friends. Um, they want to fight, okay? The army wants to fight. Um, there is not an issue as such with people not wanting to fight. Um, I know many guys who are training and they pay their own money for training. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, civilian courses where people are taught and they haven't joined up. And you might, you might say, oh, well, why don't they join up now? And they see something that you, you don't, other people don't in, in, in Western countries. They, 
they see how everybody's affected. But when they get their call up, they're not running. You know, when their day comes, there there is a lot of people in society who avoid the war. Um, I I'm only telling you what my Ukrainian friends do. They they tell me uh, they get upset at people they used to know who post pictures of the good life, uh, so to speak, in Kiev. And there's a saying in Ukraine, "Chomote ne soldat." Why are you not a soldier? But there's also what people don't see. When, when people are new to Ukraine and they visit, they, you walk around Kiev, why are they in the army? Why aren't they in the army? Well, I, the volunteer structure uh, is so complex in Ukraine. Um, I know people who give 10%, 20%, 50% more of their salary, or they're actively involved uh, in one way or another. Some people are involved in medical. Some people are involved in drones. Uh, just an example, an IT worker I know, he's part of a, of a decentralized group of FPV drone makers, and he can afford amongst that group, I don't know how many of them are, but they produce 100 FPVs a month. Okay, but he earns an American salary, an IT salary. He can do that. Uh, he should not be in uniform. So there's there's two sides of the coin. Many people in the the media doesn't focus on good things. It focuses on bad things, on controversy. And the, there, this makes me question my own history. You know, like I was a great admirer of Churchill, but I, I see flaws in Zelensky now. Now I'm thinking, was Churchill that? No, he was a human being. Um, there, Churchill definitely had flaws. <laughs> yes, he had many flaws. I read many books on him. No, but he gets he gets a coin pass from history. There's no doubt about that. FDR gets a very kind pass from history. Um, but we're under immense pressure right now. I know nobody, uh, nobody that's in the army. And, and I would say the finest human beings on this planet uh, joined the army in the first week or two of full-scale invasion. And there is one problem. Uh, there's one very big problem. And I don't know how it's affecting everybody. But, but I got a message from a friend of mine. He, he's currently wounded. He's from Odessa. Uh, he's in the 28th Brigade. They're from Odessa. At least they used to be. Now they have to come from everywhere as, as, as the brigades have to be rebuilt. Um, he doesn't live too far uh, from where the attack happened the other day, where those five children were killed. His wife is pregnant. Okay. And he told me, he says, if I can't protect my wife and my child, what is what is the point of anything if I cannot protect my wife and child? And this man has fought very hard. He's a rota commander and he, he's a very he's a highly conscientious man. This this is playing a toll on Ukraine. Uh and to 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 close up, I've seen this from Russia before. Um it's it's been over a year. No, no, not nine nine months, ten months since I've, I've been to Avdivka. But every night when they would do their frontal assaults, the artillery would come on first line position. Then they would send their men forward and fire support off to the side. And then their artillery would go to our second line. And then when they couldn't take our position at night, that's when the cluster bombs comes. That's when the phosphorus comes. W wouldn't you want to use that good stuff? Like, it, it seemed like they used it out of spite. You know, when they had their ammunition allotment for the night, they saved the gas, they saved the cluster bombs and the phosphorus till the end. And this seems to be what they do against the civilian population. Just like the Luftwaffe did, they switched from RAF airfields. Uh, we would have lost the Battle of Britain, you know, had they not switched to, the, to, to bombarding London. They switched from our airfields. They, they, they kill our women and children. Um, I, I, I've, seen this, I've seen this at a tactical level. Um, on on like frontal assaults at night, and we, we see this on the we see this. You, well, you like you said, it's not big news anymore. But when children die, it gets it gets into American and European news. That's a big effect on our morale. Going back to your point of if you see able-bodied men walking around Kiev or walking around Odessa, and they're not in uniform. You don't know what their contribution is. No. I know that one of the most important organizations for Ukraine right now is, is the railroad workers. 
there's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of them working hard every day to make sure that all the railroads continue functioning, given that Ukraine doesn't have the ability to fly anymore. Uh, so I, I think like the railroad workers in Ukraine have been called Ukraine's second army because the job is so important. Um, there's obviously other critical services, police, firefighters. Um, so if you see an able-bodied man walking around or enjoying a nice meal, you don't know what his background is, what his contribution is. I just want to make that point. That's true. Uh, so for you, Brandon, uh, what motivates you to continue the fight? You, you say you want to go back to Ukraine. You're still deeply involved in supporting the people. What is your mm. motivation after two years? Well, I I had a talk last night. You before this interview, and I talked. Um, I told you about my friend that I joined the army with when I was a boy, and uh, I'm I'm going through some difficulties now, some some personal difficulties um, with mental health uh, being here, and um, the fact uh, he says, you know, why. Why do you want to go back? That's totally cool, but is it is it your identity, or is it that you really want to be there? And uh, I told him the truth, and I'll tell you the truth. Um, part of it is it's become my identity. That's what I do. That's what I feel good about. That's what I'm I'm proud to do every day. You know. Um, but another bit is I wanna I wanna I wanna see it out with my friends. Um, and how has the war changed? How have I changed? Um, I got a phone call on our last day in England uh, before we're to go in front of a, on a stage in front of like 10, 20,000 people a couple hours before. My friend Maxime, um, he called me to tell me that he has been medically discharged. Um uh, he does have some problems, some memory problems. Uh, uh, I, I have some issues. We both have been blowing up in a truck, but but mine was AP, mine Tim was an ATGM. You know, um, uh, he, he went to rescue six guys on his own, and and three died, and he got three out. Um, he's one of my best friends. I know his family. I know his babushka, and when he calls me and tells me that he's been medically discharged. Um, and he's got all his hands and all, all his feet. Um, my first feeling was joy, you know what I mean? And it wasn't, we lost a great, we lost one of the best machine gunners, you know, like that, that, that used to be my, my priority that we, that we, that we, that we destroy Russia, we push them back. And, and that is, but my priority is my friends. Do you know what I mean? That they, that they, they live that they go home and, and be fathers or mothers. There's a lot of women, a lot of women in, in, in the army that, that they can go be sons, daughters, mothers, and fathers. Um, so that's, yes, okay, I get something out of it. I feel really good about what I do. Um, but my loyalty is to them. As has been always been my, it's, it's my greatest satisfaction. There's, there's no higher satisfaction, Jake. This might be a, a personal question, but going back over two years prior to you going to Ukraine, how fulfilled with your personal life were you going back to 2021? So I lived the dream in England, uh, self-employed, had a, had a small business in the events industry, uh, and it was just perfect. You know, I went from eight employees to shooting for everything down to three. Good profit, great life. Every loved, I think they loved me. I loved them. Um, but uh, Corona bankrupted me. And I, I moved to live with my girlfriend here in Sweden. And I lost everything. And I packed boxes for a living. Um, that was a very humbling experience. Very humbling. But I worked hard. I learned the language. I worked. Um, I I got better employment, better pay. I got my dog. Um, I learned to speak Swedish. I learned all the good things that Swedes should do, like sauna and long walks in the forest. I embraced it. Um, 
But that being said, as much as I was progressing and getting satisfaction of completely starting again, my life was in transition. Would I have gone to Ukraine if there had been no corona and I was still on 150k a year my end and spending it however I want on my friends, my family, my um, um, my boxing. I, I, I spent a lot of money on amateur boxing and kids. No, that was my life. I, I wouldn't have gone to Ukraine. Uh, but the challenges and transitions I had that I'm grateful for, the, the challenges and growth, uh, that made it all possible. I lost everything, Jake. And I learned I learned it wasn't that important. I think I've heard that message from other people before. Um, yeah. I can't imagine uh, Corona affected us all. Uh, if you want to know what my life was like in 2020 when Corona hit, uh, I wasn't allowed to go anywhere or do anything. Given that I was in a critical, critical career field in the Air Force, uh, there was a very limited number of people that could do my job in a launch control capsule. So we were not allowed to get sick. So until we got vaccinated, this was over a year, we weren't allowed to go anywhere or do anything. Uh, couldn't, um, couldn't gather in groups greater than three people. Uh, and, and I understood why. And it felt like, a, well, it's a global pandemic. Obviously, it was a national emergency. So I was in the military serving. So... I couldn't really complain. That's what I signed up for. If the Air Force told me I'm not allowed to get sick under any circumstances because they can't risk it spreading through the career fields, launch control capsules are always up 24-7, 365. So going back to, to today, Brandon, uh, people want to know, what do you do to take care of yourself? How are you um, caring for yourself so that you can care for others? Well, that saying is true, uh, but I think it's used as a cop-out for a lot of people. Um, I'm no Arnold Schwarzenegger, but uh, I've, wa I've watched some of his videos. He says, uh, you only need six hours sleep a night. And, and, and people say, I need seven. He's like, no, you need six, just sleep, sleep faster. Um, but I, I would be lying if I said that uh, the past couple of years has not taken a toll on my health. Uh, I've developed an autoimmune disease, uh, which is quite difficult to, um, particularly with stress. I have arthritis like symptoms. That's, that's one of them. Um, this is actually quite common in Donbass. Many people have stomach problems. This war has been going on over 10 years, you know, um, and I'm 37 myself. Uh, while I'm home, um, how I take care of myself, I'm trying to get my fitness back. That's that that was such a, a point of pride in my life. Um, I I was boxing till 2019. Uh, after a shoulder surgery, I was I was coaching. I was still sparring with like 18 year olds. And uh, over the past couple of years, with diet, um, a lot of sedentary lifestyle living in holes and the air is not so good and, and smoking more than I should. Um, yeah, my body's deteriorated. I'm making, I'm making some progress with that. Um, I have at least one surgery coming up. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of health issues. Um, and I'm lucky to be able to have that. Other than that though, what I've learned um, I will be honest, adrenaline can be very freeing of all other, all life's other non-immediate um, responsibilities. But I, I've learned, I'm, as I knew in Ukraine, I'm, I'm very addicted to results. So th this helps me on a self-esteem level. Uh, this helps me with a lot of challenges when I'm able to get tangible results. Um, and that involves helping friends in Ukraine, uh, my code name in our battalion is Rashala, and Rashala is a fixer, uh, somebody who can get you things. And a lot of the things I get people are unofficial. You know, if 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 you need a generator, if you need an NVG, if you need a car repair, uh, sometimes if you need to find a home for a dog, 
in Kiev. My Instagram can be used for that. You know, we, we rehome a lot of animals, as simple as that is. Um, just recently in the UK, uh, for example, it was it was probably the most stressful time uh, I've had in my life. It, it took in two weeks. Um, I went for one week to study on a course. And then two weeks of, a, of this tour with politicians and media. It's one of the most stressful times of my life I've ever had, if I'm honest. Um, as much of a toll as it took on me, we did get some results. You know, um, every day there's some result that can be done, whether it be the med packs that we're packing, uh, working on projects, um, uh, I'm also involved with radios. You know, there's a lot of equipment that comes along with radios and cables and things we acquire. If I can have a tangible result every day, uh, big or small, um, or if I can have some progress and I can do my fitness, that's how I, I that's how I manage to have a good day. If I'm honest, um, that's how I take that. That sounds really, really boring. Uh, but besides, besides my dog. Uh, I need to, I need to get my body better and I, I need to have some tangible results on a daily basis, seven days a week. Solid advice. I agree. Since you're currently in Sweden, I have to ask you, uh, what are people saying or how are they reacting to Sweden officially joining NATO? Mm. Okay. So the... We have a funny political system here. The Anglo world seems to have, have uh, generally, you know, there's there's a two party system and a couple outlier parties. Um, uh, Sweden, I don't even know how many parties they have, but uh, the majority party has, I believe, twenty three percent of the Riksdag, um, and many people would call them the far right. Um, they were opposed to NATO. OK, uh, there's other parties that were opposed to NATO, um, but since the Ukraine war, they've backtracked on that one. So that so that's on a political front. Um, most people are very enthusiastic about it. Um, I don't go to many of the Ukraine rallies. I find them mentally very uh, difficult. I will go from time to time. And I was at one last Monday uh, when I got back from the UK and um the the Stads minister the the prime minister was there speaking uh, a few different people that rally has a lot of pensioners as it's on a Monday attended by two hundred people and um, I often think that they're 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 a really good gauge for the country uh, the pensioners the older people because uh, they were here before NATO and and most of them most of them seem quite happy about it like that's a country that's had how many years of neutrality? Uh, over 200 years neutrality, and they're, they're quite proud of it. Um, they feel they feel it's a positive, I, I think, overwhelmingly. That's good to hear. I, I think so. There's a Swedish saying, they call it Juan Mola. Uh, it means to paint over, like the pretty paint. And that's a big thing in Sweden, like, oh, everything's fine. Um, but I think this war really... Um, it, it really woke up society because it's so close and they have such a history with Russia. Um, they have a long history and the Cold War, Sweden was very active. Uh, every every man who's been conscripted can tell, there's a lot of people, that's why we have so much support from Sweden because there's a lot of, you know, middle-aged white men, uh, 35 to 60, and they have money, you know, just like everywhere in the world. And they all did their conscription service and they all, the enemy was always coming from the East. You know, they did their two years in the army. So, so that, that tradition carries on. Um, yeah, they can't Juan Mola anymore. They, R Russia's there. Since we're talking about politics, can I get your rough opinion on what's happening in the U S Congress and the drama related to passing military aid for Ukraine? Mm, I've, I've had a lot of time to reflect on politics since I've been to your embassy in London uh, recently um, and meeting different politicians in the UK and and all the fed up stereotypes uh, or the feelings that people have, I have actually found them to be true. You know, I, 
we're talking about America, but in Britain, out of 20 politicians, I found three that cared, three that I can actually help them and they can help me. And, and we're in contact. Like, how cool is that, members of parliament? Um, but I would suspect it'd be the same in America, maybe even more so, because you're, you're so, you are geographically removed. Um, I'm, I'm very disappointed. Okay, I'm very disappointed in Mike Johnson and uh, all my posts now, um, my uploads. The pinned comment is the phone numbers to his office. Uh, and, and I ask that people talk politely and brief, uh, but his secretaries have to take those calls. Um, you know, a Canadian prime minister, uh, former prime minister, just passed away last week, Brian Mulroney. And um, my family were conservatives, uh, progressive conservatives, and, and he, he, he was instrumental in bringing down apartheid, actually. He, he fought tooth and nail against Margaret Thatcher. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little story about Brian Mulroney and, and what I think of American politics, what I think of Canadian politics, the West. Um, we are weak. We are weak. We are divided, and Russia is strong. And Russia is strong because they have a czar, okay? Nobody could ever accuse Adolf Hitler of being a bad leader or Joseph Stalin in, in, in the principle of leading towards one direction. Um, when Brian Mulroney was first elected by a landslide in 1984, and, and I've been learning a lot about him over the past week because, you know, how old was I in 1993 when, when, when he got voted out? Um, one f interesting fact about uh, Prime Minister Mulroney was the first phone calls he made uh, was to the Liberals that lost their seats, not to his new Conservatives. And, um, you know, a conciliatory phone call, but a respectful phone call. And, you know, you're Liberal, I'm Conservative, but I still want to work with you for Canada. And, you know, some of those people never forgot that when they won their seats later and, and we were allowed to... It, Canada had a great period uh, during the 80s and 90s um, to get the NAFTA, the free trade agreement, through. That, that There was a lot of division over that, but but that required personal relationships, uh, bipar bipartisan issues. And uh, I'm just learning a lot about uh, Mulroney. I, I, admittedly, I didn't know a lot about him, but, um, you know, the opposition is speaking kindly about him. Um, that's the politics I want to see, and I'm not seeing that in... Your country is the most important country in the world. Uh, in in reality, um, um, to the international stage, um, and and I see so much division from both sides. So I'm not going to attack a Republican and and attack a Democrat because people say nasty things to each other. And a big thing, I'm. I'm I just wish authoritarian. <laughs> Authoritarians have an advantage because public opinion doesn't matter. Yes. yes, they want to be loved. They want to be liked. They put out propaganda. Putin wants his support to be genuine. He's not going to allow democracy or free will to happen in Russia. No. But he knows it's easier to control his people if his support is genuine, which is why he crushes all opposition, dissents. There's no free press. So... Democracy in the West is complicated because we're also capitalist. And publicly traded companies only think about the next three months. They only plan for and think about their next quarterly earnings report because that's when they get punished. The stock price goes down, executives can be fired. And in democracies, people only really care about the next election. And in the United States, since we got rid of all campaign finance laws and there's just infinite money in our elections, the campaigns never end. We're always in an election. It just, there's like this brief period for like a year after a president is elected where no one should be talking about it, but then the media dramatizes it. The media gets views and gets clicks when they talk about the horse race aspect. Who's going to be you know, the Republican nominee in 2028 or the Democratic yeah. nominee in 2028. Christmas and is it, just around know, the corner. Well, it's, it's this Game of Thrones epic drama that both sides build up uh, to this fictional level and people even forget what, what is the purpose of government. 
The purpose of government is to serve the people. But people don't vote for and elect people to serve them. They vote for and elect people to destroy their enemies, to punish the people they hate. It's about... And, and the Chinese and the Russians, the Iranians, the North Koreans, they know this. They, they play it up. They're using social media and the internet to polarize everyone so that we can't unite to stop what they're trying to do. It's, it, I'm never going to give up. I'm relentless. Uh, I function that way where I don't get discouraged easily. But I know a lot of people who just detach themselves because emotionally it's exhausting. Yes. And I understand that. I understand it's it's a coping mechanism. It's self defense, but I, I'm I'm not exaggerating in that we are at the risk of thermonuclear war on a global scale if we don't get the next ten months correct. <laughs> this is a big moment for America, and I mean I I say my political opinions all the time now on the channel, but Donald Trump has to be stopped. The guy has aligned himself with authoritarians and dictators around the world, and this is the greatest danger to the globe since World War II, since Adolf Hitler. Well, I'm I'm very disturbed um, by the prospect of um, of a Trump uh, victory. Um, I try to avoid politics. Uh, at all at all costs but i think it's i think it's fair to say i'm not going to lose much support for expressing that at, at this late into the war <laughs> nobody outside the united states likes donald trump when i have this conversation with republicans they try to make this argument that america was respected more when donald trump was president and i'm i'm like who who outside of america not counting the russians <laughs> belarus North Korea, <laughs> who actually liked Donald Trump. He offended and pissed everyone off. He refused. I'm ranting. I'm sorry. I know. No, it's. Not... I, I, I understand. I understood 2016. 2016 made sense to me. The establishment wanted to give us another Clinton, another Bush. People were fed up. They wanted something different. So we gave him a shot. We gave this billionaire businessman living in a gold tower in Manhattan, a shot, and it didn't go well. So let's, we need to move on. <laughs> I'm very All concerned. Right, we're digressing, yeah. Brandon. Yeah. Where do you want but, to start uh, again? Um, I don't know. Do you, is there anything you wanted to talk about? Uh, let, yeah. let's, let's cover this first, actually. Um, for people at home who want to support Ukraine, what advice would you give them? Uh, are there any organizations that you can recommend in order for people to either donate money or get involved? Yes. Um, one thing I learned, um, I learned a lot of things in two weeks in the UK. Um, got to sit down um, with members of the Labour Party. Um, what I learned was there's a lot of free things Okay, they're not money bills. Okay, that I, I assume I assume it works the same in in American politics. Uh, it requires a certain amount of power, votes, a level of government for things that require money, and there's things that are free. And um, one thing that we talked about, if this could be a lesson, and and, and I'm sure Americans could could apply this. Uh, I'm very familiar with the British system. Um, in London, there's been new emission laws coming in. By the mayor of London, he has great power over one of the great cities of the world that many, perhaps even most of the diesel vehicles that are in the council and the emergency services will all be decommissioned. OK, now I'm just telling you this story. Um, what happens through the process of bureaucracy, um, it actually costs more money to decommission and scrap these vehicles because they, they can't be sold on for an environmental principle. Um, it costs more money to the taxpayer to do this than to send them to Ukraine. Okay. Uh, for many months, people have fought tooth and nail, government, uh, different levels, uh, who represent people, Ukraine supporters, Ukraine groups, that the mayor of London should donate many of these scrap diesel vehicles, which is what we use. Uh, I don't know if you know, you know when a truck blows up 
in 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 the movies when they shoot it up that doesn't really happen to army trucks if it was gasoline it would uh but not with diesel um we like diesel uh he has finally agreed the mayor of london to give us 50 of the ambulances that do not comply with his environmental laws and they're very well maintained because they're government vehicles as they often are um so we get 50 ambulance and everyone's like that's amazing i said no hold on to him there's thousands of vehicles council vehicles in london that run on diesel let's keep pushing you know where there's muck there's brass um we can get more many people are pushing for this and also pushing at the local government level uh, for things that don't cost money, that save the taxpayer. If our federal governments, if our national government's policy is to support Ukraine, then why can't it be the lower level of governments too? That if they're to give us those diesel vehicles, ambulance, yes, I get how acceptable that is. That's why they have medics on tour, not the people that we serve, the soldiers. But why don't they give those vehicles to our armed forces? God forbid they actually use them to fight, which is which is which is the nation's policy. So that's at a local level of government. We're having success. Um, also, we have an immigration crisis in Britain. Uh, a lot of the boats that come cross the channel illegally. Uh, the Times has helped us with this, and there's MPs I've I've met with, and a Ukrainian organization. It cost over £500,000 a year to store them in a field. And many of those boats have the high quality engines that we use in Kherson. This is why I'm part of that specific movement, because I, I, have, I have experience working the river. Um, those engines are crushed and sold at scrap prices. Um, we're starting to get media attention right now. Um, so... It's not even sold in a proceeds of crime auction. You're crushing a Honda engine, a Yamaha engine, a Mercury engine, if you know what these things cost, and you're not even selling it on. Um, it's cheaper, again, to give it to Ukraine. And this pisses off the working class. So you, you say in, in Britain, class is a fact of life, okay? And this pisses us off to no end. And the MPs who are backing us know this. Um, and it, it's, it's very good politically. Um, we will get those boats. I will go on Times Radio next week. And, and I have talked to these politicians. I've talked to my commander in Pearson so I can give accurate information uh, and what I can give, uh, what I'm allowed to about recent developments in Pearson. Um that, that costs no money, Jake. That, that's, not, that's not a policy. You, you know, we're sending our billions to Ukraine. But this is, this, is, this, is, this is an internal policy with the Home Office. We are fighting, we will win. And with the scrapping of diesel vehicles in the councils, do you know how many millions and billions that, like through bureau, bureaucratic process, it will actually cost to scrap these things when it's cheaper to give it away? If only, you don't even have to do anything. You just have to not stand in our way. Just sign that piece of paper. Um, and there's so many levels of government in America as well, where if it's national policy to support Ukraine, why can't it be lower levels of government? And we found success in Europe um, through the fire departments in Sweden and Germany. That that was a massive success. Hey, this has been sitting here forever. And uh, legally, we're not allowed to use it in Germany uh, because of this law. And uh, it works perfectly damn well. There's untold millions has gone uh, to Ukraine for, for those efforts. Um, so I would encourage everybody, thank you for listening to my story, but that's my personal experience. Um, I would encourage everybody to use your government because that's part of Russian propaganda for us to not use our government, to have low, low voter turnouts. Let's use our democracy. Write very brief letters, but to the point, to all levels of government, that you want support for Ukraine and write to the opposition. Uh, I, I would encourage that to write to Democrats, to write to Republicans. In Britain, we're very likely um, to have a Labour government within the next six months. Right? I tell them write to both. Um, so use that democracy first of all, because that that's not a money bill for you either. That's not that doesn't cost you money to donate, and it does, certainly doesn't cost our politicians. Um, if you want to donate money. Um, some people, I'm not an advocate of it, um, but the one massive NGO that I have seen do good in Ukraine, no guarantee your money's going to go to Ukraine, uh, like other 
Ukraine YouTube channels that send money to support Ukraine. Um, but one I've seen do good work in Ukraine was uh, Medicine Sans Frontier, uh, Doctors Without Borders. Um, so if, if you only want to donate officially, that's one I've seen with my eyes um, from Kostantinivka. Uh, they do critical care transports. And I know for a fact, um, a woman that served in my battalion used to used to work for them. Um, they're caring for civilians for three to six months afterwards, um, which we don't have. Ukraine, even at the state level, doesn't really have that anymore, if they ever did. Um, but otherwise, I would say support the grassroots volunteers. Um, I'll even ask you to support me. Uh, I have YouTube, Instagram, uh, people like Andre West uh, from Germany, who I send money to because I get a lot. He repairs the roads. You know, he thought that up himself. Like, how much do we spend on vehicle repairs every month from Donbass potholes? And and he actually fills them in with bricks. And we have plenty of destroyed buildings, you know, they plenty of bricks. And then he fills the rest with asphalt. Like, that's ingenious. Um, I... I spend my money on thermal scopes, on night vision. Um, I don't believe I don't spend one penny uh, that I collect, despite I'm a medic, on medical supplies because uh, there's we do need that support. Um, but I've got so much of it for free anyway, um, and I'm not really a big fan of working on people as as much as I do, and I love it. Um, I rather help them kill the enemy. You know, I don't people who only want to support medical. I'm, I work for an NGO that does mainly medical now, and I think, well, are we going to be there to build their ramps for their wheelchairs? You know, are we going to be waving the flag for the Paralympics? Uh, I think we're at this point in the war now where I, I really I advocate for anybody that's willing to do their own research. Um, I spend a lot of my donations on drones now uh, and drone components because I'm, I'm involved at that close of a level that I understand the complex needs. So... Anybody that's willing or has supported the drone effort, and some of your followers will know much more than me even, uh, which is not hard, um, please focus your support on that level because that's tourniquets don't bring victory. Uh, I'm sad to say we need them, but what we really want, um, we, also, we also need that other support. Um, but advocate, the, the most important thing anybody can do, Jake, is to use their democracy as as flawed and as as it is these days um we should engage with that more uh because that cost you no money if i support that message you, you if you don't use Brandon, it you lose it uh yeah i mean they russia briefly had democracy i think in the 90s and they were not using it properly and they allowed Putin to come to power, and now they don't have it anymore. Putin will never leave office, and no, he 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 might leave office, and maybe that might have to do with um... he's not going to willingly leave office, but some someone eventually is going to get to Putin. That's that's my personal opinion. Maybe General Budonov, maybe he can help with that. I'm I'm a big fan of his work. Eventually. When the financial situation in Russia gets worse, someone will be paid off and someone will get to Putin. That's how I think the likely end will come for him. Brandon, are there any other topics you want to address or questions you want to ask me? Mm, well, there's there's one thing I did want to talk about. Um, and um, I, I've had to consult people to talk about this. Um, higher up, because I will talk about this on Times Radio. Um, we need artillery. Okay, we need mortar rounds. Uh, such as the war now and electronic warfare is advancing so much. I don't want to go into the details of certain things, but sometimes drones don't work. Or if you if you're too successful in one area, it's just like a chessboard. They move their EW assets around. Um, but the one thing that cannot be negated is artillery. And um, I want to tell a little story about Krenki. Um, in Ukraine, everybody knows it. Um, in the 1st of December, there was a bad snowstorm. All the south of Ukraine, the war virtually stopped. 
Uh, people couldn't move. Cars were buried on the way to Odessa, for example. Uh, but what happened in Oleshki, um, I'm sorry to say this, Jake, you did report wrong once. You're pretty accurate as far as my AO goes. But you once said that uh, Oleshki uh, was, was virtually empty. It was crawling. crawling. This is the sand dune. I saw, I saw you mention this in the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the... Um, not everybody gets it right all the time, you know, but you've always been pretty good from everything I've seen. But um, our biggest successes, the reason that bridgehead that everyone talks about in Krinky and the ca the casualties have stabilized. I know one battalion, for example, that has not had a 200 a dead in over a month. Uh, that's exceptional. Um, they're light casualties that the front on the left bank has stabilized from Krinky to Oleshki. During that snowstorm, uh, when there was no drones working, because we don't have forward artillery observers anymore, um, maybe we should we should keep hold of that skill, you know, like comp map and compass work. Um, our guys got busy, our Marines and I suspect our special forces, um, but the kill count was absolutely fantastic. Uh, in some very tight areas, uh, there was over 100 Russian dead in securing those trenches. Uh, Oleshki. Uh, it was one area. Krinky was another area. Um, I don't want to say numbers, but it sounds like a, a, across the line, like pretty much the first night of the storm, a, a battalion got slaughtered, and that was just that was just good old fashioned infantry and 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 well planned assaults with no Russian artillery or mortar support. Okay, so so no drones working directing that. How how important is artillery and mortars? And Russia has it. And we don't have it now. And to be quite honest with you, um, not not a lot of the drone pilots would probably talk on a platform like this. Um, my tablet map is a joke compared to theirs. All the assets, and if I look at a drone tablet, what they see, what they know, um, they're really quite complacent now. In Kherson Oblast, and I suspect elsewhere, the way Russians move around, uh, two, three kilometers, five kilometers back, because um, we ha we have very little to shoot at them. They become very relatively quite complacent. Um, so we need that political support. We need those rounds. Um, I think if they just magically appeared next week, um, we could seriously stabilize <laughs> the lines, like seriously for months. Um, but I'll say no more about that. But I. Just that one, just that one, the whole reason we have that security on the left bank of what it is and why you're not reporting about Kherson as much now and everyone else is because of a snowstorm that happened in December. That laid the groundwork for giving us time to dig, time to have solid positions. And they've got a problem, apparently, Russian generals have a bad habit of stepping on mines. I think you might have reported on that the other day. Um, but... If, if 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 we if we don't if we don't get those rounds, we're out of business. And it's like it's like it's playing a game of chicken right now. Uh, does America want Zelensky to show you're serious and mobilize your men? He's like, well, what am I going to mobilize them with? Am I gonna, am I? Do you know what I mean? Should I send them to be slaughtered? You know, if if we had that solid ammo, I, I'm I'm not a political pundit. I think the mobilization would go through tomorrow. But otherwise, why should he send those men to be slaughtered? And and if if that's the game he's playing, I, I support President Zelensky. I do think uh, military aid in Congress will pass, uh, and and the artillery rounds from the United States will continue. But Mike Johnson's going to continue lying to everyone he can to delay it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, in my last video, you know, he's trying to convince House Republicans who support Ukraine to craft their own version of a border security and Ukraine aid bill. The goal being for it to be different than the Senate version. So even if the House passes something, he'll delay a vote for as long as he can get away with it. But if it goes back to the Senate, you, you now need 60 votes in the Senate again. So now MAGA Republicans in the Senate have another chance to kill it. What they'll want to do is amend it. So once again, it has to go back to the House to be voted on again. They're just going to keep ping-ponging it back and forth to kill as much time as possible. Mike Johnson. The fastest, and easiest, the fastest and easiest way is for the House to do the discharge petition and just 
adopt the identical version to the Senate, because then it doesn't have to go back to be voted on in the Senate again. So Mike Johnson knows exactly what he's doing. And I think he is going to continue delaying this for another month or two. But I think the vote is going to be inevitable and it will pass. So Ukraine just has to do their best until May or, or even June when the shipments can start again. Perhaps, perhaps a uh, pure fantasy on my part, but in a quick and simple solution, perhaps General Budonov uh, could could help in that matter and talk to Mike Johnson. Anyway, um, I mean, anybody that wants to talk to Mike Johnson, please talk to Mike Johnson. Uh, he's he's seriously one of the creepiest politicians that I've observed my entire life. I mean, there's been a lot of weirdos in Congress, but this guy how comfortable and, and much he enjoys lying. President Zelensky visited Washington, D.C. in December. I've got this video. I've got this picture of Johnson and Zelensky in Johnson's office. And he just looks so excited to see Zelensky saying, I support Ukraine. I'm going to do everything to make sure that aid for Ukraine passes. If your position is pro-Russia, I, I respect Viktor Orban more. I respect people who just say, yeah, I want Russia to win. I don't think Ukraine is a cause worth fighting for. But Johnson derives pleasure from this, uh, lying to the public while doing the exact opposite, knowing knowing that people are dying, knowing that he has this power. It's really creepy. That one man could wield so much power in the fate of millions. And you well, know what? Perhaps from your perspective, from your old line of work, um, the fate of billions. One man. It's too much power, Jake. It's too much power. Well, he, 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 he's Speaker of the House, second in line for the presidency, and the accountability is there's an election every two years. If the Speaker of the House does exactly what Mike Johnson is doing, the people can hold him accountable every two years by getting rid of his majority. And I hope, I pray, that's what's going to happen this November. Given what MAGA has done to, to help Russia, I have to believe that the American people will do the right thing and Speaker Johnson's not going to have any power come next January. I'm not a religious man, Jake, but I, I pray for Ukraine and, and I, I look at situations like this, I pray for America too. All right, Brandon, I think Thank we've you. hit the one hour mark. I really appreciate your time. I always appreciate talking to you. I know this won't be our last time collaborating in this way. Uh, thank you so much once again for appearing on the channel. Ever so grateful. Thank you.